There we go. Um, so yeah, a positioning map basically maps out all of the competitors on two axes. So in this instance, there's whatever financial effectiveness is and then pres prestigiousness of cars, different cars to own. I'm assuming that financial effectiveness actually means, you know, um, cost to run. So in the context of say, a media positioning map, you might say, you know, uh, one axis might be uh, niche versus mass. So media companies go after a niche audience versus a mass audience. And then potentially content quality might be another one, you know, well thought out, high quality journalism versus, you know, short, um, lower cost journalism or user generated content might be two. And you could map out, you know, your competitors on those axes. You don't have to use that, but it's a tool that might work for you. Cool. Now the next two ones are basically the same, the marketing strategy and the sales strategy. Again, I'll show you examples and I'll give you examples of these. But if, but in simple terms, marketing basically just means how will you create demand for the product via marketing tactics. So in the contents of content, a lot of you guys already addressed those elements in um, assignment one. It's basically how are you going to distribute your content via which channels, how effectively will they be? Will you have to pay to get your content to people? Um, if you've got a subscription element in your business, how will you drive leads to get people via your website to get people to sign up for, say, email, email, you know, um, an email list or register for a content community, which I think you mentioned potentially in, in the future of your idea? Um, how will you actually generate the demand for that, that to come in? You know, what are the tactics you'll use? And then after that, comes the sales strategy. And they're basically, marketing and sales are the same thing. <laughs> um, you know, marketing deals with getting, acquiring interest, making people interested in the product, and sales deals with actually getting them to buy it. So in the context of say, you know, a typical media company, sales, sales and marketing on the audience side, when you're serving your audience segment, is kind of the same thing. You just needed them to come in and become loyal via your content. Where sales strategy really changes in the context of avatar is in the context of advertising in an advertising segment. So how are you actually going to sell your advertising? And that's where you go to the stuff that we covered in the last lecture around, you know, the kinds of inventory, you know, what approach will you take in terms of selling your premium inventory? Will you try and use programmatic networks if you're a media company, all of that sort of stuff. If you're actually just a, a services, um, a services business. So, yeah, like yours, um, then the sales strategy should go be more focused on, you know, what are the key things that you need to communicate in a sales interaction? How will you actually get people in a room to convince them that they might want to go on a study tour? Or, you know, what's the sales strategy on your, you said, because a part of your business was still going to be that kind of application writing component. You know, what's the sales strategy behind that? Can you actually afford to spend your time trying to get people to sign up for that? Or is it something that needs to be automated by your website and there's not a physical sales interaction? So you're typically fine with higher higher priced goods. Sales in sales strategy means an actual physical person talking to a potential customer for a long time, multiple interactions, all that sort of stuff. Lower value sales typically need um, low touch, light or no touch from a salesperson to make them economically viable. It's called the cost of sale. So if it costs you more to sell something, then obviously you can't keep, your sales strategy needs to change. Um, the next big one is go to market. So the go to market strategy, which covers the two kind of uh, lectures that I went through for specifically media startups as well. But what's your holistic go to market strategy? Will you compete for one segment only at the start? Or are you gonna go for multiple segments? Um, and then attack other segments. Will one channel be the focus of your distribution or um, more than other channels? And outline the choice you go to market and why you've made them. This bit is actually really important when you talk to people who are trying to understand your business for the next reason. So the channel summary, what channels will you use to take your product to your segments? Um, as exactly, and it's exactly the same as the business model canvas. The reason why that those two are so important is when you actually talk to people about your business model, they'll make inferences and assumptions about um, your costs, essentially, from those two things. So if you say, 
oh yeah, I'm going to hire a sales force to take my advertising, you know, to sell my advertising um, to you know, large brands, then they'll immediately make an assumption about how much that's going to cost. And that will affect the way that they evaluate your entire business model. So you really need to be clear and, and, have, and think that through and preferably have proved it out in some, some form by your MVP. Um, we ran into that. It wasn't a challenge, but we thought really hard about how we raised our most recent round of capital from investors around our go-to-market and our channel strategy because of that exact assumption. Many um, investors and people evaluating businesses look for ones that are more capital efficient. That basically means it's not that expensive to take your product to market. So if you've got a really good channel that basically will sell it on your behalf or makes it really easy, like if you've got, you know, if for example, in content distribution, if, if WeChat is really, really effective at distributing your content, then that actually makes it easier for you to build an audience. And that's a core part of your channel strategy. Cool. Before I move on from those, any questions? As you see, I left off the financial summary one. Yep. So we could see the future, future things easily. For example, uh, I just have a book now, but uh, in the future I want to uh, translate into uh, an independent website or even uh, app or something like that, so I could put things in it. Yeah, definitely. And if, it, if, if you have a vision for where it should go, yeah. then definitely put that in because what you're trying to communicate is not what it is right now, but you're trying to communicate, hey, I've got some validated learning from my MVP. This is my business model, and this is how big it's going to be in the future. So you need to articulate that stuff as well, definitely. That's where, particularly when you go, when you talk about the market, so in the context of your idea, like you could talk about the market as being very, very large, but it's in what I would describe as a nascent state, which means it's quite young and small, and it has the potential to grow very large because of, you know, what you've, what you've told me. Um, whereas you've just got a blog and you've got your WeChat distribution kind of component to it at the moment and then potentially, you know, distributing video reviews as well. Pulling all that in at the point when that's pulled into like a community user-generated site, as you described, will actually be very, really valuable. But you'd need to basically say, well, at that point, my audience would be so many million or, you know, whatever, however many, however big you reckon it could be. So, yeah, definitely do that. I'll show you a couple of examples of how we, we did that as well in our most recent capital raising. So we'll come back to those. I might start with this. So this is the, the business that I currently work in. This is, yeah, so 24 slides. And then accompanying this was a very large, there was like more detail. So there was a more detailed kind of document as well. Um, and then there was a financial model. So that's like basically a big ass spreadsheet. So this was our, oh, we had to put that in there as a disclaimer. Legally, you guys don't have to do this because it's part of a, an assignment, but legally you have to um, preface uh, company documents like this if you're a company in Australia when you're trying to raise money. There's sort of um, disclaimers and things that you have to do. If you're trying to get money off people, you have to say, you know, you have to, they have to acknowledge that they're a sophisticated investor so that when you give them money, they give you money. They acknowledge the risk that is associated with that. Um, unless you're taking money off your family and your friends, you don't have to do that. But if you're taking it off just strangers and you're a company, you have to get them to acknowledge that they understand the risks, essentially. Uh, I don't know if we should watch that. This is, let's see. Let's see which video it is. That one's a bit long. Never mind. You guys can watch that if you're interested. It may not be. Hang on a second, I'll just.
Um, cool. So this was our, uh, this is sort of like why we exist summary. So we said there's, this is, we were kind of, this is sort of like us basically giving the summary and also saying what we do um, in the context of the market. So our market, there's a billion websites currently in the world. So already we're trying to frame up this is a very, very big market out there. Um, and most are built with um, old and pretty uh, state technology solutions like WordPress. And they were created before social networks were really kind of part of, every day, uh, of our digital experience. Um, the world, basically we say the digital world has changed. So websites now need to be dy dynamic and they need to be up update automatically and actually have uh, a community focus built into them as opposed to being static kind of brochures, which most of them are. They need to be able to integrate user-generated content, and push and pull content to and from social media and facilitate interactions between your community. So whether you're a business or a brand or a media company, you have to build a community these days and you should be doing that on, on a website that you own rather than in networks, social networks, where they might change the rules on you and you know, as Facebook did, basically you woke up, one, all these brands woke up one day and said, oh, I have to pay to communicate with my fans now via advertising. Every day, <clears throat> the market we're competing against, so we basically want to be the website platform for um, the social web of today. Every day there are 800, over 800,000 new websites spun up. So it's a big market every single day, that number is coming up, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. Um, here's some supporting research and we basically said, you know, this is, this is our, you, you mentioned, um, our, like the vision, like, where do you want to go? This is sort of a component of that. Like, this is what, this is our, if we project out 20 years from now, what we would want our platform to be, we want it to be the standard for websites built for the social web. And then we've got some supporting research to back that up around, you know, why these things are important. So our business is built on the concept of the cognitive surplus. This is where we kind of integrate um, the way thought leaders have thought about the transformation in, in digital technology. So our, our business is called Cognitives and it's actually a mashup of cognitive surplus. This guy, um, Clay Shirky, he's a Professor of Media Media Technology um, at New York State. And he wrote a book called The Cognitive Surplus. He wrote another one called Here Comes Everybody. It was about 10 years ago. And his thesis was basically the business models of the future are going to be the ones that um, turn consumers into collaborators. Airbnb and Uber are great examples of that. <coughs> and his thesis, which we believe in, is that this, we're just at the start of this trend. So media was one of the first companies to be disrupted by this. You know, um, User-generated content took over the media. Um, whereas now that trend is moving into things like marketplaces. Um, well, marketplaces, it, it arguably kind of emerged before media, to be honest, with things like eBay, but smaller type marketplaces where you can just create and in, engage a community to sell something on a niche basis. Um, on-demand economy, all of that is basically leveraging the cognitive surplus. And so that's the, the movement that underpins our business and the reason why we exist. In terms of where we're actually going to go in kind of monetary terms, we're saying that cognitives will become the digital infrastructure for the next generation of businesses leveraging this cognitive surplus. So the next eBay, Airbnb, Vox Media should be built on our platform because we enable that kind of business model to occur. So at the start, we're down here, right down at the bottom, you know, raising money. This is us projecting off in, up into the future. Currently, we enable content through the cognitive surplus. You can subscribe to our platform and then create a media website and media experience that looks and feels a lot like, you know, the Huffington Post or... SB Nation or any of these, or um, Wikipedia even, all of these media-centric outcomes that are based on people power inserting themselves into a media product. 
<clears throat> our target over the next five years for that is you know, 280,000 customers on the platform, um, which in the context of 800,000 websites being created every day isn't actually that far-fetched. The next phase for us is basically we want to e enable commerce, so actual e-commerce exchange through the platform. And that's within the next five to 10 years. And then at the top, we're basically once you have control over all of that data, then you unlock a lot more business value in terms of the way networks operate, how people can interact within that network that you control. A lot like these big platforms that, that control user data like Facebook or Google, they have a lot more power because of the user data that they control and the network that they control. I might skip that one because it's just a, a random uh, quote. Cool, so this is the problem, but as we, as we saw it, and this is how we articulated it, and we used, we introduced our competitors at this point, which you can do if you want to. So the problem, as we saw it, is basically you need to have a website that's bred for the social world of today and it needs to do a range of different things that it didn't have to before. It needs to be able to you know, handle lots of content because content is far more important and needs to be able to enable a community. The way that you actually have to do that at the moment is putting together what's a tech stack of pretty expensive um, products. These, some of them are listed on the right-hand side here, which you guys may or may not have heard of. The two at the top, NewsCred and Percolate, are very large content um, workflow distribution and production tools. There's uh, high-end analytics like, like something like Chartbeat or TrackMaven is another really big one. Usually all of that was plugged into a customized site, so a, a WordPress.org site that would typically require high-end customization from a developer. It would be quite expensive. And at the bottom, um, platforms like Rebel Mouse and Stackler, which are social aggregation distribution products. So if you want to do, if you want to write a breaking news story or something that's happening, like anything that's happening right now, you need a product like that so that you can pull content from social media so you can actually contextualize a story quicker than you could, you know, if you were on the phone. So that stack, when you look at it, typically costed between $100,000 and $500,000. So this is a price disruption we're going for. That's the problem. As a result, and, and also in addition, every year, there's about $25,000 to hundred thousand dollars worth of license fees that would come with that. So that's what we that's what we stared at and we said, right, well, there's a problem because not many, hardly anybody in real terms is going to be able to afford that. The people who can are big media companies, um, big brands, big companies, you know, that can afford to spend that. So basically, we wanted to enable what Seth Godin says is a tribe. You need a shared interest and a way to communicate. And we wanted to be that way to communicate. So the solution is our Oops. And there we go. Our platform performing those different functions. So we basically took the competitive context and we said, let's take the key functions of each of those, you know, very expensive applications and build them into our web app. We've got work content workflow tools so you can run a newsroom in the cloud. Um, a content creation interface that's similar to say Medium's a very uh, leading edge publishing platform. Um, live editing tools so you can pin and move content around the screen and what we call our social funnel, which is basically where you grab content from social media, moderate it, edit it, publish it to your audience, and then also push that content back to social media if you want to build your audience out. And all of that we built into the platform and we made it affordable. So we made it a fraction of that cost. So we were trying to go for a price disruption. We want this to be accessible and we want it to be cheap um, so you can get it on a subscription basis. So we can enable more of that 800, the 800,000 websites to be created every day. We want more of them to be able to be built on our platform. All right, once we did that, we said there's an element of disruption over and above just the fact that we're going after price. So basically everything I've talked about today is just then was like, the problem is that it's very expensive to build one of these things and the solution is that we're cheaper, which is okay but it's, that's not particularly innovative. Like that's just, you're right, this is cheaper and probably a bit easier. Within our platform, basically we said, well, there's a different way to go about producing media these days, what we call networked media products. This goes back to the cognitive surplus concept. So networked media is basically where 
I get to decide what content I consume from you as a media company, not you know, you publish stuff on your homepage and then I only get to consume that. I get to follow, say, the con your content output and then also a topic that you decide is relevant. And I can follow those things and have that curated content distributed to me in a form and a place that I want, whether it's via email, on a website, via a web app, sorry, a mobile app. You know, I get to decide my content experience. And media consumers have been trained for that They've been actually trained to expect that from social media these days. So the more that media, traditional media companies can reflect that user experience, the more effective they'll be. So we saw that and we were like, all right, let's build that into the platform. So it's a new way or a different way of, of creating and distributing content to your audience, and giving them more power over what they consume and when and how. Two really big um, examples of that are Medium and Tumblr. Lofter is another example, the, one, the platform that you've showed me from China. It's just a, a more effective way to give your, your audience the user experience they want. Cool. Then we go into our competition. In the context of the way that we talk about our competition and the way that we did for this, for this specific IM, in the, the next one I'll show you, we were actually a media company and we were literally, we looked at competitors and we mapped them out and we said, this is us and this is them. But in the context of this, we were saying, look, we're solving a problem that's different because of the price component I told you about. You either choose to put one of those stacks together and pay 100, or 100 to $500,000 or you don't at the moment. If you don't do that, then you're locked out of the technology solution. So basically we're saying we're actually, the choice in the competitive context is not between us and a bunch of other companies, it's between us and actually paying the money to put the stack together. That's where we make more sense in terms of a choice. So it's a disruption based on how people go about building websites at the moment. And as I said, a lot of those people are already locked out of the market because of the price. And this is the old way of doing it. You put together a stack of stuff. There's a couple of other um, brands in here that I didn't mention. Um, Livefire is another one recently purchased by Adobe, which is social aggregation. And that runs, if you look at any News Corp website, they, they, they use Livefire to run all of their social media aggregation and all that sort of stuff. So you put, put one of these stacks together, but the new way is just leveraging the stack that we put together for you. And that's the competitive context where we compete. It's not so much against each app because if you look at, say, this social funnel one, functionality that you guys or some of you guys would be familiar with based on what you said in your assignments, things like buffer, um, social scheduling, and also aggregation. Our feature doesn't compete head-to-head -head on functionality with those. We'll probably lose each time. But the key distinction is we put it together in a platform that you can just purchase and you don't have to have the depth. You don't get the depth, but you get the breadth of service across the different features. So that's how we compete. I might skip over this. I'll provide this to you guys uh, on, um, on Moodle and you can read through it as an example. So this is our this was our traction slide. So after all of that, we usually we were getting looks of like, oh, this sounds great, but you know, how much money have you actually made? So we literally went through and said, this is the amount of money that we've made from active customers, people who are paying us um, over the past financial year, and then these are some active channel partners that we've recently signed onto the platform. And this is the amount of customers that they're going to bring us. So this is sort of like the top level, like I was saying, the hierarchy is like people have paid us money for this. We're not making this up. And they paid us a lot of money. And then the next part is people have said that they will pay us money because then they've got this, these many clients that they're going to sell it to. So usually this was the most effective slide that we would put up or that we would talk to. because of that traction element. Cool, and then we just went into detail on the traction.
skip that. All right, cool. So this is the market. This is how we sized up the market. You can see there's the references for where we got the stats from. And we we sized it up in two different ways. So there's the website market. That's what we were playing in. But Behind that are businesses creating websites, whether they're agencies creating them or um, just you know individual businesses. So we said our target in terms of, if you remember the subscription stuff that I talked about from the last session, ARR, annualized recurring revenue, it's basically just the total amount of money we expect to make in a year. 25 million is a target, which is 2.5% of our initial target market. So that's 10,000 businesses. If we can get to that point, that means we're making $25 million a year. In the context of the total actual market, there are uh, total global market is 235 million businesses, viable businesses that we could target. So it's a huge market, $564 billion a year. ARR, if you were to capture the total market, which is totally ridiculous, obviously, but we still put it in there. Um, and then uh, projected target, 960 million ARR um, at the 400,000 customer market. Now, for you guys, that might look slight, look and feel slightly different. Doesn't matter if it, you know, the, the numbers aren't ginormous. Um, for example, when we were pitching the sports website business, it was only in Australia. We were sort of just talking about Australian to Australian numbers. So we we're saying, you know, total advertising market is X. Can we, if we can capture the sports component, a sports component of that target market, it would equate to, you know, ten million dollars a year or in advertising revenue, and that's fine as well doesn't have to be in you know ridiculously large numbers but we were raising in this round we were raising a lot of money so we needed to talk to a bigger global opportunity cool so this is our version I might just check slide numbers 21 cool yeah this is a version of go to market so go to market strategy um, based on four elements of the business. And essentially these are like go to market and channel at the same time. And I'll decide like channel being how we actually take our product, like deliver our value proposition to our customer segments and then within the business model canvas. So strategic partners we had on the left and we were basically like they're people we partner with. So in the business model canvas they would be partners. Um, Basically, we would, we've done deals with people like that to try and get them to sell our product for us. And then we've got what we call channel partners, and these guys um, sell our product on a white level basis, but we still take you know, a lot of the money. And then we've got direct sales. This is where we're directly selling via our website. So it's like a direct route to market channel. And then our ecosystem and API that's where we basically integrate with a bunch of other platforms and they provide pass back of customers if, if the integration goes well. I won't dwell on those because you guys don't have to do it. But that's a, these are the top level numbers that come out of your financial model. And then this is the team. And we actually led with our like our advisors first, as opposed to putting you know the team first. Cool. So that's the first example. I don't have time. I do have another one here which I can show you which is pretty light. This is more of a presentation deck. I might put that up on um, Moodle instead. That was an example of our um, executive summary. Probably just been done. And we tailored it forever. We had about when we were raising this round of money, which was our seed funding for Fans Unite, um, we had about 50 people we were contacting. We, and we sent this out to 50 people, tailored each one, just slight tweaks. Obviously, you guys don't have to do that, but <laughs> if you get to that point. But this is our 
uh, executive summary that would go to them as a you know as an example. It's probably a bit longer than the one that I've than, than that's set for the assignment. But you can see we basically just split it out and said this is the intro, this is who we are, um, then some elements of our strategy, what the value proposition was, monetization strategies, how we were growing, what the technology solution was, sort of a a mini version of the IM really. I'll put that up so you can read it properly. And then the other, this one, which isn't, this IM isn't as, um, as pretty as the other one. Oops. But it's it's a fair bit longer actually, so it's probably like six or seven thousand words as opposed to four. But it has slightly different structure. We went with, you know, this is the version of traction, this is what we were doing at the time. Um, business summary, we actually put in at the start, you know, what's the process, where we are in the process for raising money. That's just so when you send it to someone cold, if you're like, well, we're looking for money, are there other people involved, you know, what's, they need to know the context. Um, and then we went into, you know, trends, what the value proposition is, channel strategy, sales and marketing. Some examples, or some people say you should always include an exit strategy. Some people think you shouldn't. So it's sort of a bit confusing. We just don't put it in now because it just, I don't know if you guys ever have this, but you get like, you put something out there and you get about 20 opinions back and they're all conflicting. So when we do that, it's just easier just to remove it. <laughs> cool, I'll skip over that bit. So this was our business overview. Now I have, I've used a few of these slides through the semester, so some of them I'm assuming are gonna be pretty familiar, but some of them might look familiar. But this is our overview. How do we create value? Where are we making money, the revenue streams, and what have we achieved to date? So pretty simple. What is it? Where's the money coming from? And have you proven that you can do some of that or some of what you said you're gonna do? We went through the vision, I won't skip over that. And this was our, at that time, this was what we were doing, this is what we looked like. So this, this is like several years ago, because the site's changed a lot. We went through another redesign and it changed. And then we put in, all right, how are the users growing um, in terms of our audience? How are we onboarding people to be contributors? Because this was a user-generated content site. Um, how much content are we producing and where's, where's the target audience? Mm. Oh, and we'd actually launched, as part of this, we'd launched New Zealand and South African teams as well. So we were present in those markets. These were all the different communities that we were trying to launch. So we're saying like, this isn't just one website, this is 59 micro websites within a community. Um, and how that helped our sales strategy and also our content strategy. So you know, what made it, what made us different effective, essentially in our content strategy was this, uh, the innovation pipeline, I won't talk about that. We went into the trends. So this is where we talked about citizen journalism and examples of media companies. So we actually brought in, <clears throat> in the context of this, we were bringing in com technically competitors, but they weren't really present in this market. So what we were actually saying was, this is really big overseas. No one's really doing what we're trying to do in Australia. There, are, there were companies that were doing it slightly, like the Raw, but we're saying we want to take an American model, media model, and bring it to Australia. And then we reference, yeah, the cognitive surplus again. Value proposition, so in our instance, we had three distinct, distinct um, audience, seg uh, sorry, distinct segments that needed a value proposition delivered to them. There was the user, so the audience, the creators, which were a micro, which were a part of the user audience, but they're actually our bloggers and our journos, and then the value proposition to brands and advertisers. The 
channel strategy. So a channel strategy, in very simple terms, in the context of our audience, was what channels we're using to deliver our content. So in that instance, it was just mobile. It was a mobile responsive website, desktop and tablet, and then um, our social channels. And then also, we also did a little bit of work on how big is the audience. So obviously, smaller numbers than I showed before, but this is a mass audience for us in Australian terms. So there's 3.6 million um, men aged between 18 and 50 who are fans of one or more football team across the four football codes in Australia, A-League, AFL, NRL, and rugby. And that was our kind of core, that was our core target, which for a sports site needs to be huge because you need a critical mass of audience. The advertising revenue you can get is pretty low. <clears throat> and then I also said, all right, what's the typical journey over a week for a sports fan? And what kind of content should we be producing across the week? <clears throat> and like engagement level of interest. Oops. And our sales strategy and pricing. I showed you a bit of this in the um in the advertising lecture. The pricing tiers for advertising. So advertising inventory. So how how are we pricing our advertising on the platform? That's our pricing strategy because we were only selling advertising. There was no subscription model in this business. <clears throat> and then also how we were selling this, what we called our sponsorships, our premium inventory. So what we were trying to sell that for. And then we had key achievements, you know, sales achievements. Um, we signed up one sponsorship deal over that value onto the platform with CUB as an advertiser. And then we also said, all right, well, who are we targeting for this? So it's a sports site, you know, alcohol brands, betting and gambling, automotive finance, and uh, fast-moving consumer goods companies. Cool. Yeah. So this is a bit out of the order that I was talking about before. The market overview is basically saying, all right, well, what are we our pricing and our sales strategy, what market are we selling it into? At the time, which was 2014, those are publicly available stats on digital, digital media in Australia, so they would be exactly the same for a lot of your business ideas as well. What's the growth rate of digital advertising spend? Um, and what's the total market share worth? And then on the right-hand side, I got I managed to get a hold of some audience figures. So how much, how, you know, what's the unique audience of all of these different competitors? So on the right-hand side, there's a, a portal called the Telstra AFL um, Media Portal. And that's like the biggest site for sport, for football in Australia. And then there's a bunch of other ones in there. What was our marketing strategy? You know, user acquisition, how we were going to build our audience. So essentially create the demand. And what was the content model, which I showed you before as well. So basic content, shareable content, rich media, and then data-driven content, which we never ended up getting to at the top level. Um, we also had an editorial model because we had uh, user-generated content coming into the site. We actually had to articulate, all right, well, how are you going to manage at you know hundreds of potential bloggers coming into the site? Like, what's your workflow for that? How do you actually physically do that? because it sounds kind of challenging. Um, so we had a, a user-generated kind of content flow, um, the legal ownership around the content that was produced by the bloggers, what we got them to sign off and like a waiver, all of that sort of stuff. And then because we had an investment in technology, we had a technology section, we called it Jangle, um, which was a CMS that we built. Continued on. Might tap out of that there. Did you guys have any questions on that? It's a lot to take in. I suggest potentially just reading through those elements and picking off the bits that you like. So that was the team at the time. And then we had a bit about structure. You guys don't have to go into that. Cool. And that was just a bunch of appendices and a bunch of other stuff. As I said, that's 
that one was pretty detailed, like it, it's obviously over and above what you guys will need to do um, in terms of the detail that we went into. But the, gen the general rule is, and we can watch a video about this in a second, the general rule is the less traction you have, the more work you have to put in to your pitch. So the more work you have to do to make, try and convince people that this is a good idea, the less traction you have. The more traction you have, the less that you have to actually do that. You just say, here's my thing, people like my thing, you know, I reckon this could be big. And literally, you know, people will probably back you. Here at the back, that you might want to check out. Oops. Of other examples, so Sequoia have an investment memo structure. You could check that out as for ideas of how to structure yours. Um, that picto chart blog about startup pitch decks is is pretty good as well. There's also another one that I haven't put on here. Oh, yeah, this is like a it's not structure, but it's actually just form, like what you should put in and how you should phrase things. Um, from a guy, and then this is an actual book if you want to go. Um, if you want to go really deep on this on the topic, if you find it interesting, um, there's another site which I will just quickly spin up for you. Um, pitch decks. These are actually pitch decks, not memos, but they're kind of cool to look at because there's so many big examples on there. What what did their what did Airbnb's first first pitch deck look like? The reason why this is good to see is because a lot of these big companies um, are kind of post rationalized after the fact. Like people say, oh yeah, of course it was going to be amazing, and they must have figured this out. Like they must have known that this was the business model that they were going after. But when you read these things, you realize just how undone and how much they didn't know or how it was off their strategy was at that point because they were still learning and they were still searching for the business model. Like Airbnb, for example, famously was passed over by a bunch of like intelligent investors because they thought it was a stupid idea. Cool. Do you guys have a better idea of what you need to produce now? This is still kind of a bit vague. As I said, I'll put up those two examples, investor memo examples. I'll put up um, the pitching hacks document for you to read. Um, and then obviously the, the notes from today. And then if you've got other questions, you can just help me with them in terms of the structure. <coughs> so what I thought would be good to show is just some examples of actual um, guys pitching. So you can actually see uh, what it's like. This is a pretty long one, so we won't go through it all. But Techstars is like one of the biggest um, startup incubators in the world, and they've got a big thing in um, London. <coughs> what I like about this is there's like, there's a pitch at the start where someone's getting up and talking about their business. And then at the end, some of the investors are basically just peppering them with questions and you can get a, se a sense of what, if someone picked up your investor memo, based on listening to some of these questions, you'll get a sense of what are some of the things that they really wanna know. And so what you should really be able to do is have your investor memo explain those things, potentially try and catch all of those questions so that if they have a question and you're not in the room, they can go to it and they can get a reasonable answer. And also you get a sense of like, some of these guys, they're obviously, really passionate I'll just and also so for the off-campus guys um, I'll just share all these links with you and you can watch them yourself if you like so I'll just turn off the video <laughs> <laughs>